The next item of business is a debate on motion 14094 in the name of Clare Hockey on Scottish Government support for veterans and the armed forces community in Scotland. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Clare Hockey to speak to and move the motion. 13 minutes please Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to set out to Parliament the action the Scottish Government has taken over the last year to support veterans. This update will focus on the steps we have taken to implement the recommendations of the Scottish Veterans Commissioner's Report, Veterans Health and Wellbeing, a distinctive Scottish approach, which was published in April. This is the second annual update to Parliament on the work we are taking forward to support veterans and to recognise their unique contribution to Scotland. I was uh, honoured this morning to meet some of these veterans when I visited Erskine Care Home Facility in Bishopton. And I saw firsthand a number of fantastic projects, including the Advanced Nurse Practitioner Service and the Dementia Nurse Service. The organisation is one of many across Scotland doing excellent work to support veterans and their families. And I'm encouraged to see so many organisations are here today and we want to continue to work closely with the third sector to improve the lives of veterans. The First Minister outlined in the programme for government earlier this month our commitment to ensuring there is no disadvantage to members of the armed forces and veterans community when accessing services and support. Scotland led the way in, be in being the first country in the UK to appoint a Veterans Commissioner four years ago. Eric Fraser, CBE, was appointed to promote veterans' interests and make sure that the policies we as a government have in place are providing ex-servicemen and women with the best possible support and opportunities. Eric Fraser stepped down at the end of August, having made a significant impact on many aspects of the lives of armed forces and veterans. And I would like to thank him for all he has achieved during his time as Commissioner and wish him all the best for the future. I'm very pleased to welcome Charlie Wallace as the new Scottish Veterans Commissioner. I and my ministerial colleagues look forward to working with Charlie to build on Eric's many achievements. Eric Fraser's report into veterans' health and wellbeing recognises the strong track record in Scotland of ensuring veterans are given the best possible treatment, care and support. It also sets out 18 recommendations for strengthening and enhancing Scotland's report, support approach to providing health care and support for veterans. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring the health care needs of serving personnel and veterans are better understood and supported within the NHS. And we value the skills and experience veterans bring to their communities. And it's because of this we have accepted all of the recommendations in the Commissioner's report. Let me now set out the action we have taken so far to implement these recommendations and the work that we will take forward over the next year to continue this. Firstly, the Commissioner's report highlights that the current way in which healthcare is provided for veterans is outdated. Our current policy states all veterans should receive priority treatment for health problems they experience as a direct result of service to their country, unless another patient's needs demand higher clinical priority. The Commissioner calls for greater focus on the principles of excellence, accessibility and sustainable treatment for all veterans. This is in line with our ambition of providing safe, effective and person-centred healthcare for everyone in Scotland. And we will be working with stakeholders to develop what the Commissioner calls the distinctive Scottish approach, which ensures veterans' health sits at the heart of current and future models of service provision in Scotland. Central to, this forward, uh, central to this, taking this forward will be the Joint Group on Armed Forces and Veterans Health Care. This group is chaired by the Director General of Health and Social Care and includes representatives from the serving community and veterans organisations, Scottish Government officials and other stakeholders. The report recommends that the membership and remit of this group is refreshed to provide strategic leadership to deliver this distinctive Scottish approach to veterans health. And we agree with this recommendation. The Scottish Government is working with Veterans Scotland to refresh the group and this will ensure the right structure is in place to take forward the recommendations of the Commissioner's report as well as providing leadership to develop our wider health care for veterans policy. The model being considered will consist of a smaller operational delivery group which will deliver actions agreed by the joint group and a new structure will be in place by the end of the year. The Commissioner also highlights that the integration of health and social care has changed the way healthcare is provided in Scotland. 
We need to ensure veterans' health care is still provided to a very high standard through this new approach. And we will be working with the integrated joint boards to make sure veterans' health needs are considered in delivering of services. The main way in which veterans are supported in the health service is through NHS champions. Champions are officials who have volunteered to support armed forces personnel, veterans and their families in their area to make sure they get access to high quality services and treatment when they need it. We are working with Veterans Scotland and the joint group to strengthen the network of champions and to raise awareness of the support they provide. Will the Minister take an intervention? Uh, yes, I will. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I was fortunate, Minister, to be sitting uh, beside one of the champions earlier this week and to hear in particular the work uh, that is being done to support uh, those who have PTSD, who have mental health issues. Would you like to congratulate all who are involved in the Champions Network and indeed in this year where 100 years have passed since the armistice in 1918, the radical change in how we support veterans after combat? Claire Hawkey. Uh, I thank Mr Stevenson for his intervention and I absolutely echo uh, his words. Uh, I think the champions that we have do a fantastic job and I want to personally thank them for what, what they do. Um, and the, the change in mental health services is, and, and mental health provision is something I've spoken about many times in this chamber and I'm really proud of, of the change that there has been in terms of how we treat our veterans and, and how we treat them uh, when they are suffering from mental illness. Um, for example, earlier this year, updated uh, information was issued to NHS veterans champions, NHS chief executives and primary care leads to distribute within their health boards. And this included guidance on how veterans can share their full medical record with their GP. We're also <coughs> building links between NHS and local authority armed forces champions to reflect health and social care integration. My officials have also worked with Veterans Scotland to update information on the NHS informed website for veterans about how they can access health care. And this was followed by an awareness raising campaign in June to coincide with Armed Forces Day. NHS Inform is evaluating the veterans' content on their website to ensure that the information provided is as helpful as possible in providing online support. The Commissioner also recommended setting up a managed clinical network to oversee the delivery of veterans' health care. The Scottish Government asked NHS National Services Division to look into setting up such a network as a potential longer-term solution to ensuring equitable and sustainable health services for veterans. However, I should be clear that the Scottish Government does not drive this process. This process is managed by NHS National Services Division and I'm pleased to announce that the consideration of a proposal to establish a network has moved to stage two of the NSD planning process. This means a full application and a detailed work plan will now be developed. A range of stakeholders and interested parties will be involved in developing this proposal. The Commissioner's report highlights the importance of being able to identify veterans to understand their health needs, including health inequalities and issues such as drug misuse, and we recognise this. We are refreshing our drug strategy, Road to Recovery, which will be published later this year. And the new strategy will recognise the need for a range of services supporting different people with different needs. In spring next year, a new drug and alcohol information system will be introduced. And the new system will gather data on people engaging in drug and alcohol treatment services. And it will mean for the first time accurate data will be available on the nature and scale of drug misuse amongst veterans. The new system will provide a single record for individuals as they move through treatment and recovery services. And this will provide valuable data on veterans and allow support and services to be tailored accordingly. I welcome the focus on the mental health of veterans and their families in the Commissioner's report and it rightly highlights a number of positives and we should be proud of these. The report recognises significantly improved support for those suffering mental ill health after time spent in the armed forces. It recognises that in recent years veterans have been able to access a number of specialist and mainstream services with Scotland being in the vanguard in many ways. And it also recognises that the vast majority of those leaving the military do so without severe mental health problems and cope well with the transition to civilian life. The clarity in the, uh, in the report on the importance of mental health and wellbeing is in line with the guiding ambition in our mental health strategy that we must prevent and treat mental health problems with the same commitment, passion and drive as we do physical health problems. While there's much to be proud of, I agree with the Commissioner that there is no room for complacency and further improvements can be made. 
However, I am confident that many of the key themes and 40 actions in the Scottish Government's 10-year mental health strategy will impact positively on veterans and their families. I made a statement on Tuesday to Parliament setting out progress in delivering the strategy actions since its launch in March last year. A detailed progress report has also been published on the Scottish Government's website and I'm confident that as we fully implement the strategy, this will lead to improvements in many areas. To support improvements, I expect that in 2017-18, for the first time, that the NHS investment in mental health will have exceeded £1 billion. And our commitment to good mental health was clearly set out in the programme for government. We will introduce a comprehensive package of measures to improve mental health services for children, young people and adults and ensure that support for good mental health is embedded across our public services. We will invest an additional £250 million in the period 2022-23 to support this and we will work across all levels of government, public services, third sector and communities to deliver this. And this will help drive improvement across the whole system, including for veterans and their families. I also acknowledge the Commissioner's call to protect specialist mental health services and he mentions services provided by Combat Stress and Veterans First Point. The Scottish Government funding available to support veterans' mental health through these organisations will total over £5.8 million over the next three years. And that funding will help support veterans' first point services across six areas in Scotland to provide a one-stop shop for veterans and their families, no matter their health, social, housing, employment or other needs. It will also fund specialist mental health services and intensive treatment programmes provided by Combat Stress for veterans resident in Scotland. As members know, I recently launched the Scottish Government's Suicide Prevention Action Plan, Every Life Matters. I am clear that no death by suicide should be regarded as either acceptable or inevitable. More needs to be done to help people who are contemplating suicide, including veterans, and to ensure that the right support is in place for those who have lost loved ones to suicide. I hope this demonstrates our commitment to improving mental health services for veterans, and I look forward to considering what further help and support we can offer. I would like to recognise the fact that our veterans leave service with a range of skills that can be transferred to other careers, not least our NHS. A number of veterans have moved from the armed forces into careers within the health service and we want to do more to support veterans who wish to do this. NHS Scotland is exploring ways to promote career opportunities for veterans and this includes through case studies and information on the NHS Scotland careers website and through existing training and development opportunities. In closing, I would like to thank Eric Fraser again for his important work in highlighting not only the excellent services already in place, but how we can continue to ensure equitable and high quality services for our veterans. We have much to be proud of, but his report highlights areas where renewed focus is needed. We've accepted the recommendations set out in the report and now need to respond appropriately to the challenges raised. I've demonstrated how the government has started to implement these recommendations through the beginning of the process of setting up a managed clinical network, sharing information about the support available to veterans within the NHS and improving the structure of the joint group. And over the next year, we will work to fully implement the distinctively Scottish approach to healthcare for veterans. Presiding officer, we as a society owe a debt of gratitude to our veterans and we must ensure that this is recognised through high quality services to meet their needs. Minister, I can't remember you moving the motion. And I move the motion in my name. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I now call Maurice Corey to speak to and move Amendment 14094.2 for around eight minutes, please, Mr Corey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, may I, I must declare my interest first as an Armed Forces veteran. And I'd also like to say, first of all, that I'd like to welcome Graham Day in his new role, uh, and I wish him well as the new Minister for Veterans in the Scottish Government. I would like to also pay tribute to Keith Brown for all the work he has done over the last few years for our Armed Forces Veterans in Scotland, and thank you, uh, Keith Brown, for this. Also to Eric Fraser for his work as a former Scottish Veterans Minister. In respect to this debate, the Scottish Conservatives shall be supporting the, the Scottish Government's motion at decision time today, and I hope the Scottish Government will support my amendment, which I so move now to their motion, um, Deputy Presiding Officer. Veterans must be supported in every possible way, and I hope this debate will raise awareness of how this has and can be done. I begin by welcoming serving members of the armed forces, uh, veterans, and indeed serving members who are in the gallery for this debate today. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Also, I, believe, I begin by 
also, with his vast, with his vast uh, military experience, I welcome Charlie Wallace to his new post as a Scottish Veterans Commissioner, and I'm sure that Mr. Wallace will champion the abilities of Scotland's veterans and will ensure that they are supported. Our first Commissioner, Eric Fraser, has made an enormous effort in highlighting the voice of our armed forces community. I would like to thank him for his detailed research and he has shown both the ways in which veterans can be supported and encouraged and with more opportunities within their communities. I shall focus in this debate on the vet veterans' mental health support, an area which is vital to understand and improve upon, especially as veterans transition back into civilian life. We must be careful to remember that many veterans return to their families and communities without the weight of mental health issues. We should never assume that they are automatically suffering or in need, but nor should we assume that those who face these problems should be left to take care of themselves or make themselves known. Scotland's veterans can experience a multitude of issues upon their return from active service, PTSD, anxiety, and depression, to name but a few. Their mental health state often seems to be a factor that either causes or is influenced by these problems. Isolation is something we must emphasize here. A survey was undertaken last year found that a third of ex-service personnel felt lonely or isolated from others due to physical or mental health issues. Some veterans struggled to communicate with friends or family upon their return. Their difficulties easily seep into other aspects of their lives, such as finding suitable employment and housing. We cannot forget that the armed forces community, their families and loved ones, can also face social isolation and mental health issues, particularly if they are bereaved. At a recent event which I attended and sponsored, entitled Not Just a Wife, I was reminded of that fact. Eric Fraser's informative health and well-being report has also shown that the older generation of veterans are at a greater risk of loneliness, which they can understandably find very challenging. I have already in this chamber raised the issue of suicidal thoughts among early service leavers and female veterans. Ensuring their well-being should be of the utmost importance to the Scottish Government. Public misconceptions such as the, about the abilities and skills of veterans also pose potential problems for them. Eric Fraser raised the need to encourage society and to value the vast range of skills that veterans have to offer. And I hope the Scottish Government will open up more opportunities for ex-service personnel to contribute to their communities, free from the limited expectations and stigma of others. It is so encouraging to see the support already on offer from the variety of mental health charities in Scotland. An amazing 320 armed forces charity exists in our country. Of these, almost 50 provide health and well-being services alone. Combat Stress continually ensure that treatment programs offer the best care for their veterans. Those who are part in a long-term program with Combat Stress are considerably less likely to be affected by mental health issues such as anxiety, depression, and PTSD. Veterans participants also experience less issues of alcoholism and social involvement. Veterans breakfast clubs are another excellent avenue of support which are both cost effective and encourage veterans to meet each other in a relaxed environment at the beginning of the day. Poppy Scotland and Legion Scotland collaborate with groups such as Sam H to act as a referral pathway to those with mental health challenges and working through Veterans Gateway and befriending services. On the whole, it is reassuring to witness this marked process of support on offer to the armed forces community throughout Scotland. Veterans are treated with more respect and care than they would have once received, but we need to do more in Scotland in this sector. I welcome the funding that has been allocated thus far uh, by the Scottish Government and what has been said by the Minister in her statement already. Uh, well, uh, veterans organisations have been supported through the Scottish Veterans Fund in various projects across the country. The UK Government has also worked closely with the Samaritans this year to publish a guide on mental health issues among servicemen and women. I hope these endeavours will increase awareness of the support available to our veterans and their loved ones. However, the Scottish Government cannot become complacent when it concerns the mental well-being of Scotland's veterans. Mental health support must be given higher priority than it has been that has done, done in the past. Indeed, there was no mention, sadly, of support of, for the armed force community in the Government's recent Mental Health Strategy Progress Report. The Mental Health Service the Centre in Lucas has been closed, despite the fact there is an increasing number... Yes. 
Claire Claire Hobson. Hobson. I thank Mr Corey for, um, for taking my intervention. Um, just to assure him that obviously the Scottish Government do uh, uh, view uh, veterans' health as with a high priority. And I did actually mention veterans in my statement that I made earlier on this week. Maurice Corey. Sorry, officer. Thank you. I note what you said, Minister, and thank you for that, uh, those, those points. This means that the standard of care is nowhere near what it should be for our servicemen and women at present. And there's a stark gap in provision which must be addressed. If the resources of NHS Scotland and the Ministry of Defence could be collaboratively pooled together, this might allow these drop-in centres to reach their op optimum level of mental health support. And I would suggest to the Minister that the Vale of Leven Hospital be an ideal centre for this, particularly with the large number of military personnel in the Helensborough Lomond area in Western Bartonshire, including the Clyde Basin. The Scottish Government must encourage deeper research into the mental health issues faced by veterans, not limited to PTSD, as we know they are affected differently from the, def the general population. I hope plans will be made with a long-term view to ensure that the current service users are consistently helped as they grow older. Veterans First Point is one instance in which the Scottish Government must devote more time and effort. Its regional drop-in centres offer not only mental health services, but support in education, housing and welfare, amongst other areas. Specialist veteran therapists and clinical psychologists are on hand to tailor advice based on the specific needs of individuals under their care. The Scottish Government must work more closely with regional health boards to ensure that this lifeline of service can be underpinned and allowed to continue with greater, greater clarity of its goal. Effective governmental support for the mental well-being of our veterans can only be worthwhile. And, Deputy, and presiding officer, in conclusion... Yes, I, I just make the point as well that the government will accept his uh, uh, amendment. But I just make the point: Would he recognise the very substantial sums of money that the Scottish government has put into the Veterans First Point uh, system already? The best part of a million pounds. Morris Cody. officer, I do uh, accept that, um, but I also think we need to more focus the health boards. I think we're now into this new era, era of integrated joint health boards, of which I must declare this. I was chairman of one in Argyll Butte. I understand the problems. There's still a lot of learning curve there, so I would implore the minister uh, and the health minister to, to look at that and make sure they understand what is required from veterans of their services. I think there's a little bit of ignorance there, not from your part, but from the part of the, the health boards themselves. Um, and in conclusion, presiding officer, the effect of governmental support for well-being for our veterans can only be worthwhile if this can be secured with better communication and stability, and for example, through the health boards, then our other areas of their lives, such as housing and employment, can be made that much easier. Veteran support can be made more efficient through stronger partnership, and a solid foundation of mental health support will encourage Scotland's veterans to move forward, I can assure you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Mark Griffin to open for the Labour Party. Thank you, President Officer. Um, similar to Mr Corrie, I should also declare an interest as an Armed Forces uh, veteran. Um, I'd like to welcome the new Minister for uh, Veterans and Armed Forces formally to his post. And in line with Mr Corrie, thank um, Keith Brown for the hard work and the clear passion he brought to the uh, subject of Veterans and Armed Forces. And I think it it hasn't been higher on a government's um, agenda in the history of this parliament. I think that's testament to the work um, of Mr Brown. So thank you from um, these benches. Um, I very much welcome the opportunity to speak in the debate on the subject of Armed Forces veterans, uh, the work of the Scottish Veterans Commissioner, and to talk about some of the vital support services and charities that operate in Scotland and throughout the, the UK. And I'd like to Acknowledge from the outset uh, the debt of gratitude that Scotland owes to those who have served in the defence of freedom and put on record the continued support that we on this side of the chamber give to our armed forces, personnel and veterans in Scotland. And we're committed to continuing to work on a cross-party basis to ensure that our veterans and their families receive the support that they need and deserve. And in particular, uh, we recognise that our service personnel often need help with the transition to civilian life, uh, particularly in finding housing and employment. And we recognise that those who leave the service can bear physical and psychological scars for many years 
after their service ends. And I think uh, being a member of the armed forces, particularly during times of conflict, is immensely stressful, stressful beyond anything I think that we could imagine. Um, however, that stressful situation creates a, a level of commitment and an intense bond among service personnel that is unique, I think, to our armed forces. And I could only listen and try to take it on board and comprehend. And when I heard from a soldier who had served in Afghanistan what it was like to come under fire and what the impact was on uh, their battalion or regiment when it lost a member of its own who was as close as any member of their family. And I can only imagine how isolated someone must feel if they're discharged from the armed forces into society alone with no family support. And having had such a close bond with the comrades they fought with and possibly lost in combat, uh, going from living in such close quarters with people they considered family, um, eating, sleeping, working and socialising with the same close group, to then being discharged into a community of strangers who tend not to understand military life and the bond between people that it creates. Now, the majority of servicemen and women make an overwhelmingly successful transition into civilian life. The veterans we have in Scotland are not a problem. They are an asset, an absolute asset to communities. And as the minister said, veterans have transferable skills that they may not realise they have which then become assets to companies and communities. But for the reasons uh, I mentioned earlier, it, it really isn't hard to see why some veterans struggle to adapt and reintegrate, which can put a massive strain on family life as, as, well, on those, as well as on those without family. And it's vital that then that the advice and support services are in place for for former service personnel to adjust to living in mainstream society. And we must support plans to coordinate and deliver support and advice services from the public, the private and voluntary sectors for its service personnel, their partners and the, their children. And there are too many fantastic organisations providing support and advice to ex-service personnel and their families to mention and do justice to them all. But I wanted to mention um, some of them. And we've got to they continue to support those organisations that do tremendous work in the community for former service per personnel across Scotland, including the, the Royal British Legion. Uh, the Legion provides practical care, advice and support to armed forces personnel, ex-service men and women of all ages and um, their family. And along with Poppy Scotland runs a Poppy appeal annually. And recent appeals have emphasised the increasing need to help the, the men and women who are serving today as well as ex-service uh, people and their dependents. And the Legion also assists any service man or woman to pursue their entitlement to a war disablement pension. And every year, up to 200 ex-service personnel in Scotland are represented at war pensions tribunals. Just across the road from here, we've got the Scottish Veterans Residence, which provides residential accommodation to more than 300 ex-service people and their partners and has helped thousands of veterans throughout Scotland since it was established. The Soldiers, Sailors, Airmen and Families Association Forces Help, whose Lanarkshire branch covers my region of central Scotland, offer financial, practical and much needed emotional support to current, to current and previous members of the armed forces and their families through services like um, Forces Line, um, a support service independent of the chain of command in which seven members of the armed forces can go to in confidence that they will receive the support and advice um, they need. It also runs a forces additional needs disability support group and organises children's holidays run by volunteers that offer experiences and activities that some of the children would not normally have access to. Erskine, as well, was mentioned um, by the Minister as a, a leading provider of care for veterans in the country and provides fantastic services within the, the community. The, there are things that individual members of the Scottish Parliament can do to assist armed forces, veterans and their families in supporting some of those fantastic charities and the, the work of the Scottish Veterans Commissioner is just the, the start of the work 
um, that we can support. But, President Officer, I will close as I opened and by acknowledging the debt of gratitude that Scotland owes to those who have served in our armed forces in defence of freedom. Um, we will support the government's motion and Conservative amendment. And as always, um, we are more than happy to work on a cross-party basis to support veterans in Scotland. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. Uh, and we move now to Mike Rumbles, who's going to open for the Liberal Democrats. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, about one in 20 adults in Scotland have served in our armed forces, and while the vast majority of them go on to lead normal lives, I want to emphasize that the vast majority of them lead perfectly normal lives. A significant number don't. I speak as an ex-serviceman myself, having served some 15 years in the army, both at home and abroad. And like myself, the vast majority of ex-service ex -service personnel living in Scotland today have benefited greatly from their time in uniform. In last year's veterans debate on the 16th of November, I criticised the Scottish Government's decision not to fully fund the First Point veteran services in NHS Grampian. And we've heard about NHS First Point. I'm astonished that we don't realise it's not everywhere. Instead, the Scottish Government insisted that 50% of the funding for this service had to be the responsibility of our underfunded health boards. Grampian couldn't do this, and the service folded. Maybe our new ministers are not aware of that. I, of course. The new Grampian. ministers are very much aware of the situation at NHS Grampian. It was disappointing that NHS Grampian didn't accept the Scottish Government's offer of match funding, as the majority of health boards did. But I want to pick up on this point about NHS Grampian being underfunded. NHS Grampian's resource budget has increased by almost 20% in real terms since 2010, and in cash terms by 57.8% since 2006. So yes, it was a decision for NHS Grampian to make, but I don't think you can blame the Scottish Government for that, Mr Rumbles. Mike Rumbles. Well, I'm, I'm thankful for that intervention because maybe I can give a bit more um, information to the Minister because he's completely unaware of the situation of Grampian Health Board, and maybe that's why um, they pulled the service from Grampian Health Board. Does he understand that £165 million, £165 million was pulled from NHS Grampian's funding by the Scottish Government because the Scottish Government's own funding formula have done this over the last nine years? Now, I'm not, I mean, I wasn't going to raise the issue of funding and go on there, but the Minister has raised it and I'm going to pursue it because we cannot allow this misinformation to go across. If Grampian Health Board was funded in proportion of its population, that would be one thing. It's still 10% under that, even with the Scottish Government's own targets. But the Scottish Government has failed for the last nine years to reach its own target. And that's why Grampian Health Board could not afford to spend this money. So, well, well, it is the SNP's fault on this occasion. I'm not trying to part, make this partisan, but the Minister seems to be. And I am responding to, and certainly changing the tone of, of this debate. Well, I, I, I cannot understand the Scottish Government's position here. The truth is that the Scottish Government has been short-sighted in its refusal to fully fund the Veterans First Point Centres. If it did, we'd have that across the country, and people in my area would benefit, greatly benefit, from this service. Don't turn a blind eye to our ex-service personnel in the North East. And as much like its programme for mental health services, uh, there are other issues about suicide prevention strategy being somewhat slow. People who have risked their lives for this country and given years of service in the armed forces must be safe in the knowledge that they will return home to well-resourced services, both for mental health and physical health. And as long as the Scottish Government is cutting funding to these lifeline services, any statements of support, which I've heard today, I treat with some scepticism. I'm representing the people here I am representing. And it's about time the Scottish Government listened to, to, to voices like my own and stopped patting themselves on the back for a service right across the country which doesn't exist in Grampian. I'm thankful for the many great organisations such as Age Scotland, particularly Aid Scotland, who's stepped into the breach, but that's for only for the over 60s, not less than that in Grampian. Age Scotland, Poppy Scotland and Help for Heroes that have stepped into the breach 
in Grampian and are doing work that the Scottish Government, in my view, has a civic responsibility and a moral obligation to carry out. It's not uncommon for some service personnel to have left the armed forces many years ago and still be struggling to adjust to civil life. This summer, we also learned that both the Scottish and UK governments have either failed to log or haven't provided figures for, for one reason or another, the number of veterans who've committed or attempted to commit suicide in Scotland. I would make the case that we need to know the information, both from the Scottish Government and the UK Government. I am not trying to criticise them here. I'm trying to ask them to... I am trying to ask them to do some work here. If, if members wish to make an intervention, could I ask them to get on their feet, press their button and ask for a request? Otherwise, please keep your comments to yourself. Mr Rumbles. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. At the end of 2017, the UK-wide charity Combat Stress, working with veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental health conditions, reported a 143% rise in referrals over the past 10 years. Some veterans, and I keep mentioning this, some veterans, especially those who've served in the armed forces for only a short period of time, are at a significantly increased risk of self-harm, according to researchers at the University of Glasgow. For example, example, the risk of self-harm to veterans with a brief service currently averages 30% above the norm. And a recent report also shows that veterans are more prone to homelessness than non-veterans and are 10% more likely to become homeless in Scotland than in England. And I would like to know why. We need more work in this area. Presiding officer, some of our veterans in need have fewer transferable skills, limited family and social networks, higher than average debt, increased levels of isolation, more chance of homelessness, etc. And I welcome the work of our charities are doing to provide support for veterans in Scotland. Without them, the situation may have been much worse. And I also welcome the fact that the Scottish Government provides a measure of funding to most of our health boards who can afford to put in 50% of much funding. I make no excuses. I'm representing here the people of Grampian who feel underrepresented and not represented from many of their northeast MSPs whose voices could be raised in the same way that I'm raising them now. I really want the Scottish Government to turn around here. Presiding officer, I believe there's a moral duty on the Scottish Government to fund our health boards properly so they can all help our veterans that need help. Our veterans have all done their duty. I want the Scottish Government to do its duty for all our veterans. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to the open part of the debate. We start with Keith Brown to be followed by Brian Whittle. Keith Brown. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, our armed forces, I think it uh, is the subject of consensus here, are an essential and vital part of our communities and they contribute vastly to Scotland's economy. They also add to and enrich our society with their wealth of knowledge, skills and experience. And I think we all recognise the dedication, professionalism and the sacrifice of our armed forces. And recent conflicts and the ongoing fight against terrorism have demonstrated the magnitude of the enormous debt of gratitude spoken of by a number of members, which we owe to our armed forces, uh, to our veterans and their families. And that recognition, I think it's important to say, is in itself important to the well-being of our veterans. Uh, for example, uh, the First World War commemorations have included the drumhead service marking the start of the war, the Quinton Sill rail disaster, Scotland's entry to the Gallipoli campaign, the Battle of Lewes, the Battle of Jutland, that was both in South Queensferry and Orkney, the commemorations, and the Battle of Arras Centenary. And commemoration events will continue to be supported until we mark a century since the end of the First World War, which will be through a service to mark the centenary of the sinking of the HMY Isle Air on the 1st of January 2019. So we appreciate the sacrifice that's been made to turn a political phrase, a current phrase on its head, by the few for the many. I think that's why I welcome the steps that have been taken by the Scottish Government to recognise this sacrifice and to support our armed forces and services and to try to help them make uh, a transition to civilian life. I uh, do so on the basis that the Scottish Government, in fact none of the devolved administrations, receive any dedicated resources from the Treasury to carry out these activities. They're all done at the discretion of the devolved administrations. And despite the demand that we've heard, not least today, for specific veteran-centred services, and I think it is nothing short of stomach-churning hypocrisy and mendacity for those who want to use the ending of UK government funding for services in Scotland as an expedient to attack the Scottish Government. And I know many veterans feel the same way as well. 
The Scottish Government's 2012 Our Commitments report outlines the extensive work carried out to support veterans and their families and informed the subsequent development of a widespread network of armed forces and veterans champions. And it also committed more than £10 million to organisations supporting veterans on housing, healthcare, employability and other needs. I will do. Mike Rumbles. Does the member understand that first point services are a health service and the health service is fully devolved to the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government. It's our responsibility. Keith Brown. I, I think I, I do understand it. I think, unfortunately, the member doesn't understand that the initiative which she talks about was funded by LIBOR funding for a defined period by the UK Government, which then ended. And the, UK, and the Scottish Government has picked up the reins of that and continued to provide those services. But as I say, stomach-churning hypocrisy and mendacity from some people trying to use that as a stick to beat at the Scottish Government with, rather than properly representing the interests of veterans. Uh, the Renewing Our Commitments document was published in 2016 and reflected on Scotland's achievements so far and set out some future priorities. And I'm very proud that the Scottish Government was the first to appoint the UK's first Veterans Commissioner, Eric Fraser, who's been mentioned, uh, who recently retired. And I would also want to add my voice to thank him for his work. And as Maurice Corey mentioned, uh, succeeded by Charlie Wallace, who, who's equally dedicated to promoting the interests of former members of the armed forces. Uh, considerable progress has been made, including the fact that the Scottish Veterans Fund has, since its creation in 2008, committed over £1.3 million to more than 140 projects and organisations supporting veterans across Scotland, and the development of a programme of work that will identify and tackle any barriers experienced by service leavers when seeking civilian employment. And that employment really should be not just employment, but employment commensurate with the skills, the experience and the abilities that they've developed whilst they've been in the armed forces. I know, for example, of a colour sergeant who came out and was grateful to get a job as a truck driver, but whose experience and abilities really demanded uh, so much more. Uh, we also have helped to build stronger works, uh, working relationships between the Scottish Government, the veterans community and private sector employers. Uh, also promoting clear signposting for service delivery through the Veterans Assist uh, website and also ensured that long-term clinical needs are much better understood and supported within the NHS and improved transition pathways for those who are leaving the services. Uh, we've also taken steps to make it easier for armed forces personnel and veterans to rent and own a home. It is still the case today that most serving armed forces personnel do not understand that they are perfectly entitled to put their name down now for a council house and start to accrue points during their service. And why do they not know that? Why is the MOD not telling them of these rights that they have? Uh, over the summer, we've witnessed what I think was the ridiculous spectacle of the UK government's defence secretary trying to claim to be some kind of champion of the uh, armed forces. Um, most people uh, I talk to have um, seen this as merely some political game planning. They did this by announcing payments to armed forces personnel earning over £33,000 per annum who face modest income tax increases under the Scottish Government scheme, which saw 70% of Scottish taxpayers pay less tax. This was despite the UK Government, champion of armed forces and veterans, sharing 2,000 military and civilian jobs in Scotland since 2012, suspending the F-31 frigate contracts for the Clyde shipyards, uh, a portrayal which puts thousands of essential skills jobs at risk. Armed forces terms and conditions, and don't forget the public sector pay cap still applies uh, by the UK government, uh, but those living in Scotland of course also benefit from a wide range of services which are not available elsewhere in the UK, free school meals, prescriptions, eye tests, tuition fees and living costs uh, support and uh, higher education. So if it was the case the UK government were true champions of the armed forces, they would no doubt uh, ensure that squaddies based in England, Wales or Northern Ireland will look forward to the MOD coming forward to compensate them for the fact they don't have access to free school meals, to prescriptions, eye tests and the rest. The truth is that successive UK governments have hammered the armed forces in Scotland, including the systematic dismantling of proud Scottish regiments rooted in local communities uh, such as the one that I represent. And they've undertaken a base closure programme that will drastically reduce MOD spending in Scotland. Although there is an argument, and I can see that uh, there's an argument. Have I time to take an intervention, President Officer? Yes, if you used to. Happy to do so then. Uh, Presiding Officer, I think we're veering off the subject here. We actually should be talking about veterans and not having a political speech from the member. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Brown is. Mr Brown is close enough to the topic. Mr Brown. I made the point earlier in my speech that the way that we treat our forces has a fundamental impact on the well-being of our veterans. And if you're going to give somebody a P45 as they're serving in the front line of Afghanistan, that veteran is going to be affected by that subsequently. That is a link between the way the armed forces are treated and the, the well-being of our veterans. 
Earlier this year, an FOI request to MOD revealed that 220 staff in Scotland earn below the real living wage of £8.75, yet no UK Government action in relation to that. So I am very proud. I make no apology for the fact the Scottish Government has led from the front so that as a society we do right by our armed forces and thereby also by our veterans. No one should suffer disadvantage as a result of military service, whether that's active service personnel, veterans or spouses, or their partners or children. And Scotland has to continue to offer the excellent support for veterans that's been developed by this Parliament over recent years. I support the motion. Thank you. Brian Whittle to be followed by Angela Constance. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm delighted to take part in today's debate and it seems particularly apt uh, to be discussing support for veterans and the wider armed forces community in Scotland right now. In, that's, in not much more than six weeks we'll unite across this country and across the continent to mark 100 years since Armistice Day, the end of hostilities on the Western Front in the First World War. But today I don't want to talk about the end of war, uh, I want to talk about what happens after the end. I want to talk about what happens when those who have served the country bravely with honour and distinction take off their uniform for the last time and return to civilian life. The need for veterans to have support after their service is nothing new. Going back to the First World War, men leaving the unit received a medical examination and an army form Z-22, allowing them to claim for any disability arising from their service. This support for veterans was far from perfect, of course, but it shows that as a country, we have long recognised the need to support those who put themselves in harm's way for their country. Today, Scotland has much to be proud of when it comes to supporting veterans. But this doesn't mean there isn't more we can do, whether that's building on existing good practices or exploring completely new avenues. South Scotland, and in Ayrshire in particular, is fortunate when it comes to support for the armed forces community. Ayrshire is home to around 37,000 people who have served or are still serving and their families. It's also home to some outstanding examples of support for veterans. A short drive from here is Hollybush House. It's one of Combat Stress's three UK residential treatment centres and the only one in Scotland. Hollybush provides residential accommodation and support to veterans dealing with mental health issues, offering them a safe and private place to take time and recuperate. In Kilmarnock, the Poppy Scotland Ayrshire Welfare Centre is one of only two centres in Scotland which allows visitors to access support from a number of organisations under one roof. Built with funding from the McRobert Trust and LIBOR Fines, the centre plays host to organisations including the Regular Forces Employment Association, Veterans First Point Ayrshire, the Defence Medical Welfare Service and Combat Stress. Here someone can come in and receive help and support finding employment, securing housing, dealing with mental or physical health problems and a wide range of other issues. My grumbles. Would you, would you agree with me that the Scottish Government has a responsibility to ensure that that sort of service, which is available to your constituents, is also available to mine? Brian Whittle. I thank the member uh, for that intervention. and I understand his concern and, and, and he has exercised this in, in the chamber already. I would, I would just like to say that I'd like to see all these kind of support services available to all uh, our, our veterans across Scotland. Uh, just as, just as uh, many different specialisms within our armed forces work together as a united force, we must ensure that uh, the many organisations offering help to veterans work together uh, to deliver the best possible support. One of the best examples of partnership working among forces, charities and others to deliver wraparound support is Unforgotten Forces. Unforgotten Forces is a project bringing together 15 organisations to improve support for veterans over 65 and their families in Scotland. Led by Poppy Scotland, members of the project include Action on Hearing Loss, Age Scotland, Erskine, the Scottish Older People's Assembly, Legion Scotland, SSAFA and the University of the West of Scotland. A key feature of the forgotten, Unforgotten Forces is the ease of referral between member organisations. Contacting one group is like contacting them all. This kind of seamless working between groups makes life easier for veterans, taking some of the stress out of looking for help and allowing support organisations to deliver a better service more quickly. Unforgotten Forces is a great example of organisations working together to build a community with a shared sense of purpose. Talk to anyone who's ever served in the armed forces and they'll tell you how strong that sense of belonging to a community is. Creating that same sense of community for someone when they leave the armed forces is a vital component in helping them adjust to civilian life. 
Communities come in many forms, uh, from making new friends among veterans to finding colleagues in employment. Even something as simple as connecting with people who share a love of playing sport or supporting a football team can help tackle that sense of isolation and loss that comes to those who leave the armed forces. Now, unlike some of the, the, the members speaking today, I, I have never served in the arm, armed forces, but I have some sort of understanding of being defined as one thing one day and losing it the next. As a, a professional athlete, you spend most of your time working with a small team. You, you train together, you travel together, you lift together, and you compete together. And your entire world is defined by what you do as an athlete until one day you reach the end of your career and realize that you have to be something else now. That change can come suddenly. I didn't plan to retire from athletics when I did. Uh, when I was preparing to, to, to go to the Olympics, I happened to break my ankle. It's left me unable to train or compete at that critical time. And it's hard to explain what it feels like when a job that has so utterly dominated your life comes to such an abrupt halt. Now, I'm not suggesting by any manner of means that, that, that a career as an athlete is comparable to a career in the armed forces. Well, they both, to one degree or another, take you away from everyday life and put you in that smaller and very focused community. And acknowledging that change and having the opportunity to prepare for it can make a big difference on how it impacts you. I'm still, I've got to be honest, I'm still most comfortable in the company of my old athletics colleagues. And I, 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 if you realise, I retired over 20 years ago. And the final thing uh, I would like to highlight today is the importance of early intervention. The support available to veterans and the armed forces community is broad, from employability to health to housing to supporting the families of service personnel. Throughout Scotland, there are great examples of partnership working and innovative thinking that are helping to transform the lives of veterans and the wider armed forces community. The question we should be asking is, can we do something earlier? If a veteran needs help, do they know where to go and will they feel comfortable getting in touch? Should they be coming to the services? Or should the services be going to them? Not every veteran will need help when they leave the armed forces. But from the moment they decide it's time to leave, they should know that help is there if it's needed. Sun Tzu said that every battle is won or lost before it is ever fought. The same can be said for protecting the health of our veterans, especially their mental health. Through early intervention and building strong partnerships between organisations, we give ourselves the best chance to help veterans at the earliest possible stage. And that can make a difference in treatment and recovery. So I welcome the Scottish Government's continuing commitment to the armed forces community. As I said earlier, Scotland has much to be proud of when it comes to the way it treats its veterans. But there's still more we can do. And I look forward to working with members across the chamber on this issue in the future. Presenting officer. Thank you. I call Ale Angela Constance to be followed by Alec Rowley. Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to voice my support uh, for the armed forces and the veteran uh, community in today's debate. Like others, I want to express my thanks to Eric Fraser, Scotland's first veterans commissioner, the first in the UK, I believe, and wish his successor, Charlie Wallace, well in his endeavours in galvanising a Team Scotland approach to ensuring all spheres of government and indeed Civic Scotland play their part in providing the best possible support and opportunities to our armed forces, our veterans uh, and indeed their families. From my engagement with veterans, I often sense that they are acutely conscious of the stigma uh, associated with labels. Uh, and I think particularly for those who experience uh, mental health issues. So, the motion, I believe, sets the right tone of focusing rightly uh, on those who need support uh, and for those who make the ultimate sacrifice, but also recognise that veterans have talents and skills that we very much uh, want to tap into. Uh, and I noticed uh, a few minutes ago that my constituents, uh, Mr and Mrs Elliot, are in the gallery today and they are great assets, not just to the veterans community, uh, but also to the wider uh, Livingston community. And of course, we absolutely want Scotland to be the destination of choice when our men and women uh, return to civilian life. Now, this year marks the... Uh, certainly. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you uh, very much for giving way. It's not surely just veterans that we should be welcoming, their families as well, many who bring the transferable skills that we could use up here. So will, will you join me in welcoming the families when they return with their veterans to live in Scotland. 
Angela Conscience. Uh, aye, indeed. And uh, when I uh, was uh, Education Secretary, uh, I worked very hard uh, to um, you know, work with various organisations to um, tap into the talents uh, of uh, veterans uh, and their families, uh, particularly those who could uh, help out in our classrooms. Now, as I was saying, Sign Officer, this year marks the 75th anniversary of the Scottish War Blinded Centre in Lindburn, in my constituency, and I was really pleased that the Veterans Minister has had an early opportunity to visit this wonderful national resource, and he will no doubt recall that the Scottish War Blinded has doubled its membership in the last five years and will support any veteran with sight loss, no matter the cause. And as I stated in the recent parliamentary debate on suicide prevention, that the Scottish War Blinded provide a life enhancing and at times a life saving service due to the work they do to reduce social isolation. And this was an issue that uh, Morris uh, Corey also raised. And I was genuinely shocked by the high levels of social isolation uh, in the ex service community. And a survey by Poppy Scotland and the Royal British Legion found that 70% of respondents thought that loneliness and isolation was a really serious issue. And that the research done by the Scottish War Blinded found that nearly two thirds of respondents said that their sight loss had directly contributed to feelings uh, of loneliness. The top three reasons being problems with mobility, uh, transport and vision impairment, uh, making it very hard uh, to make friends. And the really great thing about the, the Scottish War Blinded is that they want to do more. They want to do more to help more veterans access very specialist equipment and support. And they're not even asking government or anyone else for that matter for more money to do so. But what they do need is better uh, <coughs> earlier signposting of veterans to the charity through health services and also when people are going through the process uh, to obtain the certificate uh, of vision impairment. And this is something that I've written to ministers about and I do hope that that's something that they can help with. At this point, uh, presiding officer, uh, I want to say that I do uh, recognise the logic of the, the Count Them In campaign, recognising that there is a need to know uh, who is a veteran and where they are, and that that's important information if we're going to provide uh, the right services at the right time and the right place. And I think that's particularly true in relation to health and wellbeing. And on that point, it would be very remiss of me not to mention my constituent, Mr Williamson from East Calder, who's campaigning for free swimming for veterans locally. And we've been on a wee bit of a correspondence merry-go-round uh, and the Scottish Veterans Fund, while it can be accessed to support uh, physical and mental wellbeing, it can't be used to cover the costs of existing services. I do, however, appreciate the advice of the, the Minister and Veterans Scotland who point to partnership working to uh, identify uh, a suitable organisation or, or project. So uh, the search uh, for a solution to access uh, free swimming does indeed continue. And perhaps in future considerations, uh, ministers uh, might be able to think about how funding uh, can be more uh, flexible and criteria can be more um, adaptable. As others have also reflected, uh, presiding officer, um, this year is the centenary of the end of the First World War, uh, and there's also been a, a rich seam of local uh, activity in the area that I represent. Uh, the West Lothian Museum Service has a fantastic historic Twitter feed uh, at WW1 West Lothian, which follows the, the regiments uh, of the now Royal uh, Scots uh, and have been tweeting their experiences as if it was in uh, real time. And there are various other uh, local projects uh, run by volunteers, such as the 1914-18 Fault House Remembers. There's also a, a website called Far From The Front, which tells the story of life in West Calder during the Great War. And next month, there will be a play in the, the West Kirk of Calder telling the story of West Lothian and Bangor Hospital uh, during the war. And Bangor Hospital was uh, requisitioned uh, by the military in 1915 uh, and housed over 3,000 wounded servicemen uh, by uh, 1918. So my final um, point for today, presiding officer, is I want to end by paying tribute uh, to the members of the Livingston branch of the Royal British Legion. They do a fantastic and very poignant uh, festival of remembrance. They've recently embarked on a tour of remembrance in France and Belgium uh, on behalf of the people of Livingston, paying their uh, respects and commemorating the last 100 days of the, the, the Great War. But uh, the 
very last point I want to make that as we approach Remembrance Day, uh, we should also uh, acknowledge the importance of what we do every day, not just on uh, Remembrance Day, to support um, our veterans, uh, the armed forces, uh, and indeed their families. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call Alex Rowley to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Alex Rowley. President Officer, I'm pleased to speak in this debate today on support for veterans and the armed forces community in Scotland. Like others have said, I would want at the outset to acknowledge some of the good work that is taking place in Scotland. I believe that good progress has been made through the Scottish Government, local government and the many services and veterans organisations working together. The document issued by the Scottish Veterans Minister just this week has demonstrated much of that good work. Our veterans and armed forces community serve and have, have served our country with honour, courage and commitment. And it is right that we take note of this here today and offer the respect and gratitude of this parliament for the services they have undertaken. It is also right that we remember those who lost their lives serving our country. It should be obvious that veterans and their families are given the support required when it is needed. However, this is not always the case, and particularly for those who have been involved in recent conflicts. It is easy to switch off to the reality of conflict when that conflict is taking place thousands of miles away and poses no immediate threat to you or your family. But the realities of recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan saw 632 British soldiers killed and tens of thousands injured. But even those statistics cannot allow me to begin to imagine the horrific experience of being in armed conflict. And that is why here in Scotland, I believe we all have a duty to all who have served in our armed forces, and particularly those who have served in recent conflicts and now need our support. Combat Stress, the UK-wide charity working with veterans with PTSD and other mental health conditions, have seen a 143% rise in referrals over the past 10 years. It is not right that many veterans who have served their country are left behind on return, with a number of them ending up homeless or jobless or lacking the support that they need. These are the people that have put their lives on the line doing a job that they were sent to do. Surely they deserve better treatment when they return. Two months ago, I raised a motion in this parliament on the issue of veteran suicide figures. This motion was not about political point scoring. It was about addressing the very real concerns that a number of UK veterans who take their own lives, the number of UK veterans, uh, is not being accounted for and has been overlooked. The data is not made available to the public. Sharing this information would allow for a better understanding of what is going on and would provide a vital resource to prevent further tragedies. This is the view supported by the human rights lawyer, Amar Anwar, and the former head of the Royal Navy, Admiral Lord West, as well as the Mental Health Foundation in Scotland. Earlier this week, we had the ministerial statement updating the Chamber on the annual report of the Government's mental health strategy. However, however, information on the numbers of former service personnel taking their own lives was not available, and I would reiterate again here today, why is that the case? I wrote... Yeah. Claire Hawkey. I, I thank Alex Riley for, for taking my intervention. Can I just offer him a little bit of reassurance in that the uh, Suicide Prevention Action Plan, one of the actions in that is that we will investigate every death by suicide. And so I, I would uh, anticipate that that would identify if that person who had died was a veteran. So that information at that point in time would be available. Alec Rowley. If that was able to achieve that, then that would certainly be a step in the right direction. And indeed, I wrote to the Minister for Parliamentary Business and Veterans on the 19th of July this year to ask what has been done to address the issue. And he responded, stating that the Scottish Government is exploring how to share data between databases to address this problem. 
That was back in August, and it may be that he is able to say more about that today. I would like to end by quoting presiding officer from a lady I met a number of years ago, Rose Gentle, a leading campaigner whose 19-year-old son, Gordon, of the Royal Highland Fusiliers, was killed by a roadside bomb in Basara in Iraq 2004. Rose Gentle told the Scotsman newspaper earlier this year, it is wrong that information on veteran suicides is kept hidden. They should have veteran there beside the list of occupations to let people understand what's happening. The situation for boys leaving the service now is just as bad as it ever was. Basically, it all gets back to what they have seen. And then they have got to come back and live with it, the nightmares, and at the same time trying to get their lives going again. A lot end up homeless and struggling. They are really just depressed and feel like life is not living. And she says it can take 10 or 15 years or more for them to admit to what's happening to them. But we're going to see more of it in the future. And she concludes, it's charities that are mostly helping these boys, not government. Now, I accept the points that Keith Brown made about the need for the UK government to be more involved and we should unite in putting the pressure on the UK government to show the same initiative that we've seen in Scotland. I have sadly met many families who have lost loved ones in the most recent armed conflicts, and they all speak of the need for better support <coughs> and services for those who came home. So good progress is being made, but more must be done to ensure that the support is available for veterans when that support is needed. Thank you. I call Gordon MacDonald, to be followed by James Dornan. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Dreghorn and Redford Infantry and Cavalry Barracks are located in my constituency of Edinburgh Pentlands, and the Army personnel, both serving and retired, and their families are an integral and valued part of the community. The report recognises that there is a significant number of men and women in our communities who struggle with service-related injuries and conditions. It also points out that since the introduction of veteran services were established, that specialist physical and mental health services in Scotland has had a significant impact over subsequent years and has rightly attracted considerable attention and praise." End quote. And I'm very pleased that this government is building on this with the recently announced increased investment in mental health services, from the additional 5.8 million funding over the next three years to First Point and Combat Stress, to help provide specialist mental health support for veterans, to a further 800 mental health professions, professionals being recruited over the next five ye years in key areas such as GP practices and accident emergency driving improvements in the service that will benefit veterans and their families. It's clear that the Scottish Government's support for the armed forces community is absolute. The Veterans First Point in Lothian was the original project established during 2009 and is now part of a network of eight centres across Scotland. What gives the project the strength and support it has, I believe, is no small part down to the fact that it was designed in collaboration with veterans. Veterans who were seeking a mental health and well-being service which understood them as well as meeting their needs in a clinical matter for wider support and advice. It's 10 years since the Scottish Veterans Fund was established by the Scottish Government supported by Standard Life and has provided over £1.3 million of funding to charities and organisations supporting over 150 projects. The Scottish Veteran Fund goes a long way in supporting initiatives to improve employment opportunities and help veterans transition after serving, not least in my own constituency and across Edinburgh. The funding awards made earlier this year is supporting some of the sterling organisations and projects for veterans across the Lothians. Support in Mind Scotland is one of these organisations which has been awarded £29,000 <laughs> from the Scottish Veterans Funds to develop the Veterans Community Cafe at the Stafford Centre over the next two years. With the help of the SVF funding over the past year, the cafe has been able to open <laughs> weekly on Wednesday evenings at the Stafford Centre, 
Veterans and their families are welcome for hot drinks, hot food and a chat, as well as Tai Chi and meditation if they wish. This community focus with a focus on well-being is also at the core of the Lothians Veterans Centre, which is another organisation that is be benefiting, benefiting from SVF funding. It has been going since 2009 with an aim, first and foremost, to create a welcoming and friendly environment, providing personal centred support for ex-service personnel and their families from across Edinburgh and the Lothians. The charity provides important information, advice and support on health, employment, training and housing, the areas where we know veterans require the most assistance. Well, I thank the Scottish Government for this funding. Of course, we know that funding from vet for veterans charities come from a wide range of funders and individuals. And I want to take a moment to mention Tom Gilzean, who it was re recently reported is within touching distance of hitting his, his £1 million target of collecting for a range of charities. Tom is a well-known face in Edinburgh. He's a veteran himself and has been collecting funds for his favourite charities for 22 years mainly around the Princess Street area. And one of the organisations that has benefited from his years of collecting donations from the public is the Edinburgh Personnel Recovery Centre. It provides residential accommodation for 12 personnel and 15 day attendees within the grounds of the Erskine Edinburgh home. The Edinburgh Personnel Recovery Centre is managed entirely by army personnel who are responsible for the welfare and recovery of their resident soldiers. Presiding officer, one issue that I would like to touch on that affects many veterans is homelessness. We are all aware homelessness has, has a huge impact on people's health and well-being, and I greatly appreciate the Scottish Government's determination on this issue. Their commitment to providing funding to Scottish veteran residencies to deliver affordable rental homes not only for former Armed Forces members and their families, but also to those in need of temporary accommodation. In addition, funding is being provided by the Scottish Government to the Scottish Veterans Garden City Project and to provide priority access to veterans who wish to own their own home and require assistance through the low-cost initiative for first-time buyers. But I have one concern I want to highlight. The Public Accounts Committee earlier this year found that at a time of housing crisis across the, M the UK, the MOD had 10,000 empty service family homes. That's 20% of the total lying empty. The committee also found that this number of empty homes across the UK had remained unchanged in 21 years. In Scotland, there are 1,000 empty homes, empty MOD homes, and in Edinburgh, they amount to 169 lying empty, many of them in my constituency. Wouldn't it be helpful to homeless veterans, especially those that feel isolated, if the MOD allowed them to be housed on a temporary basis in those empty homes before they were moved on to a, a permanent tenancy of their own? Presiding officer, supporting our serving personnel and their families is a commitment we all share, and that must not end when they stop serving. Members just continue. I must have been prescient there. Uh, James Dornan to be followed by Tom Mason. Mr Thank Dornan, you. please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, during the summer recess, I was invited to attend a military tattoo at Edinburgh Castle. Unfortunately, I was unable to attend, but I have had the privilege of witnessing this spectacular before. As I was invited in my then role as Convener of Education and Skills by the Lowland Armed Forces and Cadets by Colonel Gibson as part of the Year of Young People, I sent a member of my staff as I was interested in all the good work being carried out by and for young people across Scotland. Now, you may be thinking that this debate is in support of those who have retired from their military career and not about those just learning the ropes. But it's not every day I take part in a military debate in this chamber, and I wanted to take the opportunity to thank all the volunteers who work with cadets to provide them with a positive destination and tools for life. And, of course, many of the volunteers are vets or servicemen and women themselves. It's a perfect opportunity to acknowledge the wonderful work being done and highlight the importance of veterans in the general society. The Armed Forces is a complex and varied organisation when men and women join up, be it Army, Air Force or Navy, the variety of roles can be quite staggering. Within each of these organisations, there's a complex network of roles from cooks to engineers, 
military police to medics. These skills aren't just vital to the defence of the country, but are the foundations to a transferable skill set, which can only benefit Scotland when these retiring from service use them within our economy and public service industries. And that is why I wholeheartedly welcome this debate on how Scotland welcomes and provides for those who serve the country. I've been aware for some time of the plight of servicemen and women who suffer from homelessness, as my colleague Gordon MacDonald has just talked about, after leaving the armed forces. I'd worked closely with a number of uh, veterans when they were based in Cathcart Old Parish Church in my constituency. And I remember uh, Keith Brown when he was uh, the minister for, the ve for veterans being at that place. And I, I saw and I heard for myself the toll that forces life and leaving that life can have on individuals trying to reintegrate into mainstream society. Research shows that ex-armed forces personnel are more likely to be homeless than the rest of the population with debt, mental health problems and life-changing issues such as post-traumatic stress disorder being contributing factors. But having been a board member of a housing association whilst a councillor, ignoring how helpful they generally try to be, I decided that what I would do was write to every housing associ association across my home city of Glasgow to ask what provisions they're making for Scotland's veterans community. And the responses, were, while varied, were very encouraging. If any member for Glasgow or further field thinks it might be helpful for me to share some of these responses to use this information in their own constituency, please just contact my office as they're available. I wish I had time to share every response, but as I said, these are available for any member or indeed veteran who wishes to see them. There are some housing associations who have no definitive policies when it comes to the housing and support of veterans, but they have promised now a policy review and I was encouraged to hear this. There were others who have more proactive procedures in place, such as Link Housing Association, who recognise the challenges faced by people leaving or being discharged from the armed forces, said they will be guided by the recommendations in the Scottish Government's Scottish Housing Allocation, and will ensure that when assessing applications from ex-service personnel, will give consideration to ex-service personnel who require adapted housing as a, role, as a result of their injury or disability, not impose residency or local connection criteria which may disadvantage ex-service personnel from fair and equal access to housing and be mindful of and supportive to the needs of ex-service personnel, wives, widowers, civil partners whose spouse is killed in action or dies before discharge date. However, presiding officer, the response from Glasgow Housing Association was by far the most encouraging of all. After responding to my letter, and then discussing how we could move this forward with the Chief Executive of Wheatley Group, Martin Armstrong, GHA have now set aside 10 homes per year for the specific purpose of being available for former Armed Forces personnel. In an interview in the Evening Times, Mr Armstrong said, we've always given as much support as we can to help veterans settle back into civilian life, including with their housing. But we thought that the idea to support people coming out of the Armed Forces by setting aside a guaranteed number of homes, as suggested by Mr Dornan, was a good one. We are delighted to earmark 10 homes a year to help. I'd like to thank Mr Armstrong for not only listening to my request to help, but for setting out a standard of support for our veterans, which I hope will be replicated across this country as far as each and every housing association is able. And I do appreciate that GHA is a particularly large organisation and not everybody else could do uh, some of the things that they're able to do because of that size. If we want to encourage retired armed forces personnel to make Scotland their home, then it's imperative that they have the very basic right of a roof over their head. Speaking to a nurse who is herself a retired service woman, she gave us an insight into how difficult it is to re-engage on Civvy Street. Captain Catherine Phillip works in a voluntary role with veterans now and has a personal hand in supporting many former military personnel. She told us that most vets, when they leave the armed forces, work as nurses, join the police, work in prisons. She said she continued to say that vets feel a need to care and give back. We would stop at the scene of an accident and give help because that's how we were trained. We will try things we've never tried before because our training tells us that's how we will learn. The words of Captain Philip or Cathy, as she insists when being called, are why this motion is so important and why we must continue to do our best for those who have served in our defence forces and who then can use those skills for the betterment of society. Our veterans ask very little of us in return for their service and want to contribute in a meaningful way to the fabric of Scotland. But it's not just for their benefit, it benefits society too. 
that Cathy Phillips, Captain Cathy Phillips says to us, if you want a job done well, then employ a veteran. And I think they're very wise words. But I would like to finish off with just recognising that this is the centenary of the end of the World War I. And those of you who are just a wee bit older than me, probably it's only you here, Stuart, uh, will remember the words of Lloyd George, who said that we're returning to a home, homes fit for heroes. So let's house those heroes use their skills and begin to pay them back for what they've given us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Tom Mason to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. And Mr Stevenson will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Mason, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I'm pleased to be able to speak in this debate and to pay tribute to those who have put their lives on line in the service of our country. I recognise, like many across the chamber, that with the best will in the world, we will have, from, from time to time, we need to send our service personnel to fight on our behalf. In such circumstances, we have an ob absolute obligation to look after them and their families to the highest possible standard. Now, as a much younger man, back in 1958, indeed during the formative years of the National Health Service, I saw the problems caused by a backlog of Second World War veterans who had not been properly cared for. I had been stupid enough to play around with explosives at the expense of my left hand. In a twist of irony, this was a few months after I'd been accepted to RAF Cranwell to train as a fighter pilot. Presiding officer, given my subsequent track record of accidents, it probably saved the, pu the public a lot of money. <laughs> During my recovery period at Roehampton Hospital, I witnessed a multitude of veterans from the Second World War who had still not received their artificial limbs. Bust in and out on a daily basis to attend non-existent appointments, often repeating the process day in and day out, starting in the early hours and returning unseen, disappointed and late. It was frankly degrading. Shocked and astounded by the situation because I was a young teenager, it led me to my very first political action, organising a wheelchair protest across Row 108 in London. Eventually we made the evening papers and a junior minister was dispatched to quell the riot. In the end, the end things got a little better and we now have our health service to provide better service. Fortunately, the care we provide to veterans has improved significantly in the period since. I've been very pleased that instead of simply focusing on physical injuries, we look to help with mental health, life skills, and living arrangements. But I don't believe we can honestly say that it is job done or end of story. Mental health particularly is still a real issue. My colleague Maurice Corey spoke eloquently on both the challenges that service personnel face, but also the perceptions we as a society have around the care of our veterans. We must be careful to treat those people as valued and valuable members of society that they are. Now, in my own region of the North East, we have made some fantastic organisations, such as Aberdeenshire Salute Project, supporting and linking up to ex-services. This is a project, for example, which ties to, tries to provide all ex-service for veterans, including family members, with a single point of contact for support throughout the local area. Such ventures can be vital for our veteran community, as many can be unaware of the support they can get or have subsequent trouble accessing it. it is, with this idea in mind, I must urge caution. It is great that we have a third sector organisation willing and able to take on these tasks and we are well served by more than 300 veteran charities across Scotland. However, I do feel that the public sector can do better. In the North East, we were extremely disappointed to see our local veteran first point centre in Aberdeen closed last year after a funding shortfall. Of all the things that we, need seemingly, we can seemingly find money for, this would seem to be an obvious choice. And I urge ministers to look into this again in the run-up to the upcoming budget. Of course, the other problem issue in this debate is around housing. Too often we do not see our ex-service too often we see our ex-service personnel struggling to find somewhere to live. We see it on our streets with nearly every, in every, nearly every city, and it should shame us. Now we've had as, at a Scottish and UK level initiative designed to help veterans find a home. But we are not yet at a point where this is being effectively communicated to those in need. I believe that everything, everything we can do in this respect should go, go a long way. 
Presiding officer, I firmly believe that there are those who put themselves forward to defend not just our country, but our ideals and values it represents, deserve the very best support we have to offer. But I do recognise there is a lot, I do recognise a lot is being done, but we can do better. And that is what we should resolve to do, and do so cooperate to give back to our veterans and their families for the great service they have done for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Stuart Stevenson. Then we move to closing speeches. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I start by declaring that I am a Northern Area Committee member uh, of the Highland Reserve Forces and Cadets Association. And in that role, I'm very happy uh, to support uh, reservists, many of whom, of course, uh, are uh, former uh, servicemen. And, and, and indeed, I, I note James Dornan's reference to the cadets, who play a very valuable role, uh, often again, uh, through the leadership uh, of uh, former service uh, personnel in uh, contributing to uh, uh, young people right across Scotland, right across uh, the UK. The Highland uh, RFCA is uh, covering about a quarter of the landmass of the United Kingdom, extending north from the Fourth Clyde Valley to encompass the whole of the Scottish Highlands and Islands. Now, Earlier this week, on Tuesday, I had the privilege to meet the Defence uh, Medical Welfare Service that uh, Brian Whittle uh, referred to, a fantastic organisation which, since 1943, has given support to more than one million patients and their families. Uh, and I was greatly impressed uh, by the work that's been done uh, by that organisation and by many others. And it was a privilege to hear uh, many of the stories on Tuesday. Now, the backdrop to this, of course, is well illustrated uh, when in May 1915, Lieutenant Colonel John McRae wrote the poem In Flanders Fields after witnessing uh, the death of a friend the day before. Uh, we are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, lived, loved and were loved and now lie in Flanders Fields. That illustrates the experience uh, of service personnel, and it should be no surprise that that experience can lead uh, to needs after they've served in the forces uh, that we address today and have to address uh, for a long time. That poem has echoed down the ages, the hundred plus years since it was written, is the inspiration why uh, we wear the little red poppy uh, on Armistice Day. And of course, as I referred to in my intervention on the minister, uh, we approach uh, the 100 year anniversary of the armistice, not the end of the conflict, but the armistice. Uh, and we should celebrate that. We've seen many memorial services and preparations to honor those who fought in that great conflict and the very great uh, sacrifices that they made. I've been fortunate in my life to have traveled to many uh, corners of the world and in many of them uh, one sees the imperial uh, war graves that there are. Uh, when I was in Burma uh, some 40 years ago the only thing that seemed to work effectively in Burma uh, was uh, the graveyard outside Rangoon where every blade of grass was within a millimeter of its neighbor uh, where the book of remembrance was absolutely pristine and the memorial there was excellent. Nothing else in that country worked properly. So it was great to see that uh, dedication. Um, in my own constituency, uh, a week ago, we saw the community come together for the rededication of memorial, uh, marking the commencement of the war. Bands played, prayers were given, scriptures and poems recited, including the poem I've just quoted. And the Lord Lieutenant of Bampshire, Claire Russell, said, the dedication will in no way glorify war or mark any kind of celebration of what was one of the darkest moments in the history of mankind. Rather, it's an occasion for people to remember and to work for peace. So that was a truly intergenerational tribute as members of the Royal British Legion stood alongside uniformed uh, youth organizations. And that happened uh, right across Scotland, uh, indicating the respect and regard that we have uh, for our veterans. I'm proud that we in Scotland have uh, taken the steps we are. Um, I think other nations in these islands uh, equally respect our veterans. Um, they do so in different ways and support them in different ways. I think there's a little bit could be learned 
from the way we do it. Uh, Gordon MacDonald referred to the Scottish uh, Veterans Fund. Um, the, the, this past year, for example, that has supported uh, some uh, 19 projects and continues uh, to be an important uh, support that's provided to veterans. Now, the motion before us and many of the contributions referred to Eric Fraser as the Veterans Commissioner and uh, Colonel Charlie Wallace, who will be a new Veterans Commissioner. Well, that's an important role. Uh, with something like 400,000 veterans who have served in our armed forces for some point in their lives, uh, that's important. And 20,000 people across the UK leave our armed forces every year. And the transition to civilian life can be difficult uh, for some people. There are over 50 veterans organizations. That's part of the 300 plus that Maurice Corey uh, referred to as charities in Scotland. Poppy Scotland is well known to us. Uh, veterans First Point uh, would be another. Um, these organizations doing their own thing, working often with the Scottish government are integral uh, to what we do. I want to just uh, look at what the Scottish Veterans Commissioner uh, said in his report. Uh, he described testimony from John Johnson, a veteran and research project officer at Borders General Hospital, who was helped by Veterans First Point. Um, John states, the whole ethos of Veterans First Point is they go the extra mile for everyone who accesses the service. They help me get out of the house and meet like-minded people, which is ultimately the reason I'm here today. I really the member's to just closing. Even if you finish treatment or completed a program, never closes its door uh, to you. Um, my co personal connections are modest. Um, my father did know Lloyd George James Dornan um, and uh, was his election agent uh, when he stood uh, for, for, the, uh, uh, for the rectorial ship of Edinburgh University. And his cousin was in Lloyd George's government uh, in the, uh, during the First War and was ennobled by Ramsay MacDonald in the 1920s. Uh, <laughs> presiding officer, thank you. Thank you. There's no holding you back, Mr Stevenson. Uh, I call Jackie Bailey to close for Labour, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Um, I, I have always acknowledged that Stuart Stevenson had multiple careers. Um, I didn't realise he was as old as the hills and remembered back to um, whatever time it was. But presiding officer, it gives me great pleasure to close this debate today on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party. And like others, I want to start by thanking Keith Brown for his service as a minister, particularly in this policy area. We haven't always agreed on every policy area, but on this one, we certainly have. And I'd also like to use this opportunity to welcome both Graham Day and Claire Hockey to their new ministerial posts. Um, I should also tell the Chamber that I'm the Deputy Convener of the Cross Party Group on Armed Forces, Veterans and Their Families. I know my role. It's to keep Maurice Corey in check which I'm happy to say I fail miserably at. Can I welcome the many veterans and serving personnel who have been in the chamber today um, and thank them, as others have done, for all their service to the country. We are very grateful to them. As my constituency is now probably home to most of our armed forces personnel, I'm particularly interested in how provision is made across a range of services, health, housing, education, and employment to name but four. I'll not have time to do all of this justice in, I was gonna say six minutes, I'm told I have seven, so I will certainly try, um, but I hope to have a positive dialogue with the new minister, Graham Day, in the future. So he's not getting off lightly today. The focus of today's debate has been on access to health services, and in particular, mental health services, mentioned by almost every speaker in the chamber. And I too, welcome the work done by Scotland's first commissioner for veterans, Eric Fraser, on health and well-being, and to welcome the new commissioner, Charlie Wallace, to, to his post. And I look forward to working with him in the future. But in considering mental health, let me reference the work done by the Forces in Mind Trust with their report, Call to Mind Scotland, published this time two years ago. Their review of mental health services for veterans praised the work carried out in Scotland and the commitment of professionals to do more, but it also identified critical gaps. In a series of something like 16 recommendations, they signposted key areas 
for improvement. The report from the Veterans Commissioner very helpfully builds on that early work and some of the recommendations, not surprisingly, cover similar areas for improvement. Members from across the Chamber have covered some of those recommendations um, this afternoon and I welcome many of the comments made by the Minister for Mental Health in her opening contribution. But let me just push just a little more because we know what the problem is. We have some of the solutions suggested in the recommendations from two reports what we need is an implementation and monitoring framework. Who is responsible for each action? When will that action be achieved? And importantly, how much resource will be attached? Now, I welcome the global figures outlined by the Minister in her earlier contribution. But it's useful to tease out what applies to veterans and which health boards are providing what services. And I hope she will take the time to look at that. I'm keen and I'm sure it's an ambition shared across the Chamber that the government walks the walk to make this a reality. Sticking to one local thing, can I support Maurice Corrie's suggestion about a specific specialist mental health unit at the Vale of Leven Hospital? It's disappointing that the MOD doesn't appear to be that interested, but I hope that the Minister Claire Hockey might indeed be persuaded. Let me turn briefly to housing touched on by other members. I'm very conscious that there are veterans who leave the forces and end up being homeless. Whether it's through a lack of preparation before they leave the service or an inability to cope with life on Civvy Street, homelessness can and should be prevented. The numbers are going the wrong way and I ask the Minister to take a look at what more can be done for prevention. Moving on to education, which I don't think anybody else has raised, I want to raise two very specific issues. Firstly, the service pupil premium, which is provided by the Department of Education in England for pastoral care, and secondly, the MOD Education Support Fund. The service children premium is not available in Scotland, is not part of the criteria for pupil equity funding. That's disappointing, given the concentration of forces families in particular local authority areas. Secondly, the Education Support Fund started life in 2011 with three million pounds, grew to six million in 2014, which was welcome, and then for the next two years, we'll have a budget of three million and two million. And whilst I welcome its continuation by the UK government, I am disappointed that the numbers are going the wrong way. Scotland appears to have received above average funding from this route, that's great. It's helped to deliver support activities for those local authorities where there are large clusters of service children in their schools, providing help during what we know are stressful periods of relocation and deployment separation. So let me make a positive suggestion to the Minister. Instead of short-term project funding, how about having a Scottish service pupil premium that would actually deliver sustainable and long-term support, allowing our schools and local authorities to plan better? Now, I'm told that stress and the consequences of it is already legislated for in the Additional Support for Learning Act of 2004. It's also part of GERFEC. That's really welcome. But it needs to be properly funded and the current formula doesn't take the needs of service children into account. So I really hope and I would encourage the Minister to consider this and report back to Parliament at a future date. Finally, Presiding Officer, let me turn briefly to employment. I know there is much work going on to ensure that veterans are supported into employment. There is more to do on training and transition. And I welcome that focus on employment, but I also want to mention the important role um, that's played by military spouses. Military spouses perform a critical role in supporting our servicemen and women, but the huge array of skills that they have are going unrecognized and they struggle to find work in places around our military bases. Now, like Maurice Corey, in my own area of Helensburgh, Recruit for Spouses is doing great work to open doors for military spouses and using their skills and talents to benefit the local economy, and I hope to see more of that. Finally, presiding officer, like Morris, I recently attended a photographic e exhibition in the Parliament by Wendy Fox called Not Just a Wife. It illustrated that in pictures and stories, each of them, for each of these military spouses, absolutely inspiring and I look forward to working with the new minister to make progress on all of these issues going forward. Thank you and I call Edwin Mountain to close for the Conservatives. Mr Mountain please.
Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to thank Claire Hohey for bringing this motion forward, which I'm very happy to support, and I'm also happy to support the amendment of my party. I, I ought to declare at the outset, like Maurice Corrie, Keith Brown, Mike Rumbles, and Mark Griffin, that I'm also a veteran. I'm not going to make the mistake of saying, as I did last time, that I was a soldier because I was co or that we were all soldiers together, because Keith Brown rapidly corrected me, saying he was a Marine. I'm a veteran of the Blues and Royals, the same regiment which my son now serves in. At this stage, I'd also like to take the opportunity to personally thank Eric Fraser for the energy and dedication he brought to his role as Scotland's first Veterans Commissioner. And I'd like to welcome his successor, Charlie Wallace, another veteran to the role, and I'm sure he'll bring the same passion uh, to supporting our veterans as Eric Fraser did. In my closing, I'd like to mention one or two of the things that have been brought up today. These are the points that I think are important. Maurice Corrie talked about isolation. But I say to you, it's not just ex-service personnel who can feel isolated. Families, partners do as well. On being discharged, service personnel and their families are no longer part of a tight-knit community that they're used to. This can give rise to loneliness, and sometimes in the case of the serving personnel of being worthless. We need to ensure that their skills, which are numerous, allow them to come part of the new teams, thus worthwhile members of the new communities they join. Maurice Curry made it clear that we need partnerships between government and charitable organisations to support veterans, and I wholeheartedly agree. And Brian Whittle built on that. He spoke about how difficult it is one day to be part of the small team committed dedicated, and the next day feeling cast adrift. Wise word. Some find transition difficult, some find it easy. Tom Mason spoke about the obligation to look after veterans and their families, and he said that the job is not done till it is complete, and that we have to do more. I agree. Mark Griffin spoke and highlighted about the debt of, debt of gratitude Scotland owes to all our armed forces and their families. Again, I agree. Mike Rumble stressed the need for early intervention and appropriate medical care being made available. Keith Brown spoke about the importance of armed forces champions. They are really important. Angela Constance spoke about the need for a Team Scotland approach to our veterans. Absolutely right. Alex Rowley said that when it, when it comes to veterans, we must never leave anyone behind. We never should, and we never will. It's an excellent summary of the position. Gordon MacDonald spoke of the need for specialist medical and mental services for veterans that need it. He also spoke about homelessness, which I will come back to, and why home and veterans should never be without a roof over their head. James Doran spoke about volunteering and the part that veterans played in that. And it is a great transferable skill set that they bring from the services. Stuart Stevenson talked about reservists and how they contributed to the armed services and how they also should not be overlooked when we're talking about this. And Jackie Bailey spoke about the need to identify that those who need help and what we should do to help them. And I agree. Now, I want to talk very briefly about homeless veterans. I agree that it's vitally important and we could do more to use unused married quarters for veterans. It's a good idea. It's something that the services have struggled with, I know, because as units are posted in and out of areas of Scotland, they have to have the quarters available for the families. And it's very difficult to know how many of those quarters are going to be needed at any stage. But I do believe it's an idea that we should look at more. And it's an issue that is not too difficult to solve. And we should be able to balance the current use of army quarters against future use. And therefore, I believe it's something that we could work cross-party to, to, to come to a solution on. Now, one of the things that uh, was also mentioned by the previous uh, veterans champion is the need to identify people that needed help early. And I just stress that we should never forget those people who leave the services earlier than they plan to. Those are the people that feel most vulnerable and often need our help. So we should be finding ways, I would suggest, of monitoring those people, looking at them and identifying early on when they need help 
before they actually ask it. Now, presiding officer, it's clear to me and I think everyone in this chamber that veterans and their families require support at all stages of their life. And I have to mention something which I mention every single time when we talk about veterans, and that's the protection from legacy investigations. Parliament may remember I recounted the story of Dennis Hutchins in the chamber at the end of last year. And I'd like to remind those in this chamber of his story again. Because very brave veterans who have put their lives on the line to defend their country are still being hounded in their retirement and dragged through the courts to face accusations that have already been investigated and closed. Dennis Hutchins, a former lifeguard, is just one of many of soldiers who are in that position. He served in Northern Ireland during the Troubles and is facing legal action. After two investigations, Dennis was told the matter was closed. However, he's now been charged with attempted murder, despite no evidence, no living witnesses, and the loss of key forensic evidence. I don't believe that this is right, and I believe as parliamentarians, we must fulfill our very basic duty to our veterans by protecting these, kind, these people from witch hunts that are going on. Can I yes. just caution you, uh, Mr Mount, so far it's been okay, but we must watch if there are live proceedings, I've, court proceedings, so I, I would say that uh, sufficient has been said, let's put it like you. that. Absolutely. Please uh, continue. Oh, you're I'm, taking intervention. Yes, Mr Ron. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I'm just hoping that the, the member isn't suggesting that because somebody was in the armed forces or is a veteran, that he therefore should be immune from prosecution for, for anything that he committed or, or anything that occurred while he was in, in the forces. Can I say to members, I'd be happier for reasons I've just expounded that we don't pursue this particular um, area at this moment. I, you've made your point. I, I think you should continue with your speech with my cautionary words there. Okay, and, and I very much take that point. And, and if I can just say, I absolutely believe that everyone should be held accountable for, the, for their actions. 90% of the population, though, will have little idea what it's like to face split-second decisions during combat, knowing that inaction could cost lives. Thankfully, most of us have not faced had to face that. Moving forward, therefore, I would like to encourage the Scotland's Veteran Commissioner, the Scottish Government, and members of this chamber to look at those Scottish veterans who are faced by legacy inve uh, investigations and wonder whether, in service of their country, they have done enough without being hounded for actions 40 years ago. The Scottish Government supports the ongoing work of the Scottish Government, sorry, the Scottish Conservatives support the ongoing work of the Scottish Government in repaying the debt that we have to our Scottish veterans. And we as a party look forward to seeing Charlie Wallace building on the excellent work of the previous Commissioner. And I also look forward to working with the new Minister of Veterans Affairs and say that if he's supporting our veterans, I will do everything I can to help. Thank you. I call on... Um, <laughs> I call on Graham Day. I forgot your name for a moment. I call on Graham Day to close for the Government Minister till decision time, please. Uh, Presiding officer, let me begin by thanking members for their contributions to debate, that, a debate that served, I think, to remind all of us that many MSPs from across the political spectrum have a close personal interest in our armed forces community. Uh, the role of veterans minister is one I'm delighted and honoured to take on in the uh, three months between being appointed and this my first debate as Scottish veterans minister. I've visited a range of organisations and employers that support veterans. I've been meeting veterans ranging in age and situation and in many conversations uh, 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 with them, which has been given me helpful insights and ideas into where we need to focus as a government. It's all been extremely helpful because my job is to build on Keith Brown's work on improving the lives of and support for our armed forces and veterans community here in Scotland. And it was excellent work, including the creation of the Veterans Commissioner Post and the redevelopment of the Scottish Veterans Fund. And I join Jackie Bailey, Morris Corey and Mark Griffin in recognising that. And in terms of helpful pointers, let me welcome a number of contributions from today's debate from colleagues. Morris Corey uh, noted uh, the role of local health and social care partnerships in, in delivering service. I agree with them. Uh, I think they're pivotal to delivery in terms of long-term sustainable services. And um, I would expect them to deliver in a way that reflects veterans' priorities and the military covenant commitments. 
Angel Constance noted the work of the Scottish War Blinded, and having attended their annual conference, I was very much struck by the incredibly positive view that users had of the support being afforded them by that organisation. Brian Whittle highlighted the work of Holly Bush House, which I, I also visited recently, and he's correct about the great work done there by Combat Stress. And let me note, in acknowledging that, the partnership working that's gone on there between Combat Stress and Ayrshire and Al Annan are in NHS. And his analogy between athletics and armed forces was quite thought-provoking, and I think it will have resonated with the veterans present. Alex Rowley, and another thoughtful and considered contribution, touched on the data gathering issue. And I'm not in a position to greatly expand of, uh, on what I said to him in the exchange of letters, but for the benefit of the Chamber, the government is, ex um, is looking uh, at how information that's held on the NHS Central Register might be transferable to the ISD in order that we can improve the collection of data on veterans and of the, who have contact with NHS mental health services. And once established, that information can be used not only to, to, to track the, the tragedies that occur at times, but also highlight those who are at risk and what support they might need. So there's, there's a lot of potential there, and I, and I welcome Alec Rowley's uh, interest in that subject. Uh, Gordon MacDonald and James Dornan um, both uh, offered some interesting ideas around housing. Uh, and let me acknowledge uh, James Dornan's efforts to secure Glasgow Housing Association's commitment to provide 10 houses specifically for service personnel on an annual basis. There were another, a number of other um, very welcome contributions. Uh, Jackie uh, Bailey set me a, a series of challenges. Uh, I, I'm not going to have the time to respond to those in detail. But I too look forward to engaging on these, uh, I think. Uh, presiding officer, one of the first tasks I embarked upon in government was to undertake a range of discussions with my ministerial colleagues to ensure that we have a whole of government approach to supporting our armed forces community. I'm pleased to say that across areas such as health, housing and employability, the response has been entirely positive. We'll be working closely together, potentially with other colleagues in the year ahead to improve and refine the support on offering offer to our veterans. And partnership working across the public, private and charitable sector is also key here. And the role played, for example, by armed forces champions and local authorities remains crucial. I'm committed to strengthening our, our network of champions in local authorities as well as other public bodies and work in genuine partnership with them. The presiding officer, as well as updating Parliament, this debate has provided an opportunity to welcome our new Veterans Commissioner, Charlie Wallace, to the post and thank Eric Fraser for his work over the past four years. I'd entirely echo the earlier words of thanks from around the chamber and note in particular Eric's work to change perceptions and ensure we see veterans as assets, not burdens. I think that's been incredibly important. The Scottish Government this week has published the Scottish Government's Support for Veterans and Armed Forces Community in Scotland document, which sets out some of what we have delivered, but also highlights the actions we're taking to look across ministerial portfolios at, se portfolios at service delivery to identify and understand areas for improvement. The needs of veterans are likely to change in the years ahead as we see a shift in the demographics of the population. So it's right we consider how we need to adapt going forward. We're working as part of reviewing our service provision and in keeping with that partnership approach I touched on earlier, we're working alongside the Ministry of Defence and other devolved administrations on a new veterans strategy. Presiding officer, we're extremely aware that accurate data and better identification at the point of referral are essential to develop a clearer picture of needs. I'm therefore delighted to confirm a positive outcome to the Royal British Legion and Poppy Scotland's Count Them In campaign as touched upon by Angela Constance. Earlier today, the National Records of Scotland set out the current plans for the census in 2021, which included a new question on veterans to provide robust statistics on the size, location and profile of our veterans here in Scotland. I know that this plan will be welcomed widely and it will help us, along with our partner organisations, to develop and improve services. The final decision, of course, will lie with the Scottish Parliament, but I can advise members that subject to the legislative agenda, a draft order will be laid in late 2019. However, we're also aware that having easy access to the right information is vital for the armed forces community, in particular those who are transitioning out of the services or perhaps moving to Scotland for the first time. Over the past year, the government has therefore continued to improve how we provide information about the services that are available. For example, in June, we published Welcome to Scotland, 
Um, information uh, will also be a key was also a key recommendation in the Commissioner's housing report. And this year we've published an updated version of the housing guide redesigned to improve its content, visual impact and accessibility. I'm also continuing to work with my colleague, the Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, to look at how we can better address and prevent homelessness and, uh, amongst our veterans' population. The Veterans Employability Strategic Group, very briefly. Maurice Corey. Yeah, um, I welcome the comments the Minister said. On the relation to MOD housing, I have had some success with that, with that MOD label, Royal Navy in Faz Lane, where we have moved families around there. So there is a door, there's an opportunity there, and if the Minister would like to discuss how I did it, I'm more than happy to do so. Minister, there's an invitation you uh, can Absolutely, another invitation to engage, and, and I'll, I'll take that offer up. The Veterans Employment Strategic Group is progressing our engagement on employability and continues to take forward the Veteran Commissioner's previous recommendations, including in areas such as work placements, accreditation and mapping of military skills into the civilian workplace. Earlier today, I was pleased to launch a Veterans Employability Concordat with key partners on the Veterans Employability Strategic Group, which sets out our enduring partnership arrangement and to support those transitioning from the armed forces into fulfilling civilian careers. We're also accelerating opportunities to create business workspaces near military bases to help those who want to develop their own business. We are, of course, lucky to have a strong veterans charitable sector here in Scotland, and I've already had the opportunity to meet with Veterans Scotland, Poppy Scotland, Legion Scotland, and many others who are delivering great support. And the East Scottish Government continues to support veterans organisations and the charities directly through the Scottish Veterans Fund. These projects and initiatives provide essential support to our veterans community. This year marks the 10th year anniversary of the Veterans Fund, with more than £1.3 million given to over 150 projects throughout Scotland. Presiding officer, looking to the future, our focus will continue to be on working positively and collaboratively across government and the wider charitable and private sectors to champion our armed, force, armed forces community. There are great examples of support for veterans throughout local authorities in Scotland, and I'm keen to see that best practice shared widely. I'm also keen that we continue to see cross-party support both here and more locally on delivering for veterans. I think this debate uh, today has shown that MSPs, in the main, are capable of, uh, of taking that approach. And let me acknowledge and welcome that. President, obviously, we know that there are many areas where we are leading the way here in Scotland. A number of members have acknowledged that. But it's right that we take stock in order to ensure we're maximising efficiency and ensure we are adapting to changing needs. Because, President, officer, I and my ministerial colleagues, along with the other members of this parliament, remain committed to providing the best possible levels of support for veterans both now and in the future. Presiding officer. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on Scottish Government support for veterans and the armed forces community in Scotland. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 14131 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revised business programme for next week. Could I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to say so now? Can I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Uh, move, the motion? Uh, move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 14131 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. And there are two questions to be put at decision time today. The first question is that amendment 14094.2 in the name of Maurice Corrie, which seeks to amend motion 14094 in the name of Claire Hockey on Scottish Government support for veterans and the armed forces community in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 14094 in the name of Claire Hockey as amended be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>